welcome to Walnut Grove on this Memorial Day weekend. We're glad to have you all here. Uh, so glad to see everyone's smiling face this morning. And uh, we're going to all worship together and, and have a good Sunday morning. A uh, special thank you this morning to uh, Dr. Jeff Price. I, I have a tough time saying that because he's Jeff to me. <laughs> but that's all right. I'll, I'll get used to it one of these days, Jeff. <laughs> uh, thank you for bringing the message this morning. We really appreciate that as we go through. We thank you for your financial support. Um, if, if you have an offering this morning, you can place them into the offering pans up here or, or even wait till after church is over or, or whatever be the case. Uh, I do want to mention in front of me is a, a box for a special offering. Um, and just want to remind you that that box is up here. If you uh, are so inclined to give to that special offering, I would be uh, much appreciated. Um, weekly prayer gatherings are on Monday mornings. However, uh, due to the fact that tomorrow is Memorial Day and we, uh, we think a lot of people will either be at parades or some kind of activity going on, there will be no uh, prayer meeting tomorrow morning. Um, because of that. We didn't think there would be a whole lot here with those types of things. Uh, once again, at least for another day or another week, um, Jonathan Hanover is our emergency contact. Um, so if you need to get a hold of him, his number is in the bulletin at United Methodist First in Kenton. Uh, there will be an Ad Council meeting on Monday, June the 6th, 6.30. Uh, Mission Society is going to meet at on the 7th uh, at Mr. Cheesy's in Dunkirk. Um, are there any other announcements from anyone in the church? Uh, a couple other things I just happened to notice. Uh, a couple places, actually. Don and Kay have an anniversary later on this week, so happy anniversary to you. And uh, as I was getting ready to set my phone down up here, a, a thing popped up. Um, Pat's one of my friends on Facebook, and it's her birthday today. So happy birthday, Pat, and glad to see uh, both sons with you. It's, it's nice, nice, and thanks for coming, guys. Appreciate it. At this time, then, we will uh, move into a time of prelude, so I'm going to ask Betty to uh, lead us in that prelude.
Thank you, Betty. At this time, we'll move into our call to worship, and I'm going to ask that if you're able, please stand with me and, and respond in those sections. And then remain standing if you're able for our song of adoration, followed by our opening prayer. Rejoice in, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. You will always rejoice in the Lord. Let us worship our Lord. Our opening song is uh, Guide Me Thou, O Great Jehovah. It's number 96 in the hymnal. It's up on the screen as well. Uh, there's more in the sanctuary this morning. Last week I had to kind of get on you because I couldn't hear you. Um, so everybody sing out. Our gracious and kind, loving Heavenly Father, we come to you today in a, in a sense to worship and honor you as we're going through. We ask that you be with us as we go through this service and help us to just get closer to you. Uh, it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Scripture lesson this morning comes from Psalms, uh, Psalm 97. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shoes re shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and he consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all peoples see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments. Lord, for you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are the exalted far above all gods. 
Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light shines on the righteous and joy in the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are, his, are righteous, and praise his holy name. Thus ends the reading from his word. At this time, we are going to, uh, to move into a, a session of uh, prayer. Um, so at this time, are there any joys gonna, or concerns? I'm going to start by welcoming my sister, Pat Harper, um, here for the weekend and, excuse me, recognizing her retirement. First grade, <laughs> long time, long time. Um, at her retirement party, I noticed a sign said, the legend has retired. Same building all these years, first graders. She is very much loved. And so happy for you, sweet. And also, I think we um, need to be in devout prayer for our country, for the world, all that we have going on, all these uh, dear children and teachers that lost their lives this past week, just unimaginable. Anybody have any prayers to lift up? I just would like us to continue, and I'm sure we are, but continue to remember the Bloom family. Am I missing anybody? Thank you, Hannah. As we move into this time of prayer, I um, want everybody to take a little bit of time. I know there's a lot of prayer requests on your heart that you know some of you just aren't ready, ready to lift up in public. And so uh, at this time, I, I would ask that you take those to the Lord as, uh, as Betty leads us in a, a short interlude before the prayer. most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning um, just thanking you for the many wonders that, that you have done over the past week and weeks as we go through. Uh, you know, as we look outside, uh, uh, the trees are really greening up. We see corn and beans growing in the fields. We see all of this stuff going on. Well, we, we do a lot of things, but we also want to remember, especially on this weekend, the, the reason that we can do those many things is because of so many that throughout history have paid the ultimate sacrifice for us to be able to do these things. We would ask that you be with those that are still in serving uh, today to protect us so that we can still have many of the privileges and freedoms that we do. Uh, we ask that, that you be with them and protect them as they protect us. We look to you today, Lord, with uh, some with heavy hearts, uh, and, and we want to bring forward our, uh, our prayer list. We want to remember today the Bloom family um, and the, the passing of Mason. We'd ask that you be with them. Um, wrap them in your arms. Show them some comfort in this rough and terrible time. We ask that you be with those people in Texas that have lost loved ones, children. Um, once again, wrap them in your arms and try to 
find some way of getting them some comfort in, in this terrible time. We pray for those on our prayer list. Pray for Dick. We pray for Lori. Pray for Jerry. We pray for Steve. Pray for Bob. We pray for Kathy. Pray for Kim. And we pray for Bob. And we pray for Louie. And dear Lord, uh, we put a special prayer in for our, our church. Um, we're, we're going to be coming on some times where we're going to have to make some decisions. And so we ask that you be with us as we make those tough decisions uh, that we need. And we ask for your guidance in some of those decisions as we go forth and do some of those types of things. Um, we pray for our pastor. Um, we pray that, that he is getting recharged and ready to go, and, and when he comes back next week, he'll be all recharged and fired up and ready to, to carry back on with his duties here at Walnut Grove. Once again, we pray for our country and we pray for the world. Uh, we just ask that you be with us and take care of us and show us uh, the things that you would. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, your son, who came into the world, gave his life that, that we may live. And he taught us as, as he was doing his ministry how to pray. And he said these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Um, we'll move on now to uh, the hymn of praise, um, Abide With Me, and you can remain seated. I'll let you remain seated. You sang pretty good last time. So we'll remain seated. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 5. It's on the screen and 584 in the hymnal.
Our sermon text this morning is brought to us by Dr. Jeff, and uh, he can come on up. And I didn't want to forget Teresa. Thanks for being here this morning. I, I didn't want to get left out. That, that could be problems, you know. She is so, the boss. Yeah, well. <laughs> Good morning. I've been dealing with some uh, I don't, allergies or whatever. My voice isn't as strong as I would like it to be, but we'll, we, with God's grace, we'll muddle through this. Uh, I and speaking of the boss, um, she gave me uh, strict orders to give you an update on LifeWise, and um, so I need to do that right up front. LifeWise. Remember, is the release time that we have for the children. We're trying to launch that. We actually have launched. Uh, we are moving forward, and uh, we plan to be in um, St. John's Lutheran Church uh, uh, teaching young children grades K or 1 through 6 uh, in the fall starting September 12th. This, that's exciting. That's exciting news that we're going to reach out to our young people. Um, St. John's has already uh, uh, given us the okay and moving forward with that. I'm uh, also uh, happy to say that we were able to purchase a bus from uh, Kenton uh, City Schools and they gave us a good deal on the bus that we were able to get. <clears throat> now we're just, we're looking for a couple of things. One is a little bit of funding, so if you have some, uh, you know, if you have that in your heart. But secondly, and most importantly, we need you to pray. We need you to pray for that, um, for for that uh, ministry to move forward in our school, for God to do a, a great work for us today. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about Revelation. So when you when you uh, you know, think about the book of Revelation, maybe that conjures up different ideas about, you know, what it is. Um, it's sometimes a mysterious book, but it's really just a culmination. It is the end of the story. It's a culmination of all of the prophecies of the Bible put together in the other 65 books. And so I think it's a very exciting book. I enjoy uh, studying it. I enjoy reading uh, and, and uh, learning about what God has for us. It is really the apocalypse, uh, the, that is the revelation of who Jesus Christ really is in his glory. And that's, that's all it is. Uh, if you would, uh, Lisa, Lisa is uh, running my computer up there and appreciate that very much. Um, there are four major interpretations of the book of Revelation. I don't know if you're aware of that. There's a symbolic uh, view, there's a historicist view, a preterist view, and a futurist view of the book of Revelation as you study it. And so the symbolic is that, it's just that, that uh, Revelation is nothing more than a bunch of symbols uh, it's the it's the uh, it's sort of this battle between good and evil. In the end, God wins. It's, uh, the historicist view would say that no, it's the it is the depiction. It is a a, a revelation of the um, church age. That is the 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 age in which uh, the after the death until the present. And so it's it's kind of taken us through a a history of that. Um, and it talks about the Protestant, you know, of course, the Protestant Reformation, the Catholic Church, and all of those things are read into that view. Number three, the Preterist view believes that the book of Revelation was actually, um, it was actually fulfilled in 70 AD, that John wrote the book sometime in the 60 AD uh, category, and that it was fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman army in 70 AD. And then there is the futurist view that Revelation is indeed a prophecy of events regarding the end times and that most of the book has yet to be fulfilled. <clears throat> um, I will tell you that most theologians would put me in the 
number four category. That's why it's highlighted there. I think that, and I probably am, but I believe all of these views. I think that's the confusion sometimes about the book of Revelation. All of these are probably true in certain circumstances. It is symbolic. It is historic. It is. It, it was fulfilled in, in 70 AD, but guess what? It's going to be fulfilled again in a greater sense uh, when, the, uh, when those events are unveiled. So I believe all four are true, but I, will just, uh, I just wanted to be up front with you that probably I would be labeled a futurist. That is, I believe that the book of Revelation uh, holds a lot of the keys of what is going on, maybe even in the world today. There are actually, we're going to look at one letter. We're just looking at a microcosm of the book of Revelation. <clears throat> we're looking at one of seven letters that were written by uh, Jesus. They were recorded by John, but they were written by Jesus to the seven churches. And there they are on the map up here. Uh, Laodicea is circled there. That's the one that we're going to focus on. That's simply because when I was here the last time, your, your pastor read that passage and I said, hey, I've done some study on that. And in fact, uh, I've done some podcasts and I'll give you that in a minute. But um, yeah, I would like to come and talk with your uh, congregation about that. And he was good enough to allow me to do that today. So uh, very happy to be here. It is truly a blessing uh, to bring to you what I believe uh, I have learned uh, through my study. The seven churches, um, uh, actually, there were many more Christian churches. You might say, why didn't, uh, you know, John was uh, uh, nearly 90 years old when he wrote the book. I believe it was written when he was in exile. Uh, the historians, uh, many historians, uh, date that to right around between 81 and 96 AD because Domitian is the one who, Domitian is the Roman emperor who, who banished John to the island of Patmos. And it's there that he wrote uh, the book. It's clearly there that he wrote the book on the island of Patmos and that he wrote to these seven churches. Why did he write to these seven churches? Some might say because of geography, but He's nearly 90 years old in a time period when life expectancy was probably 50 or 60. You think he would write maybe to the Church of Rome. It was the largest city. It was a thriving church. Um, it needed guidance and direction. You would think that it, he would write to Rome. You think, well, maybe he would have wrote a letter to Jerusalem. There, were, there was a thriving church in Jerusalem, young Christians. And that was the, that was the center uh, of the growing movement of Christianity. But he chose those seven churches, and he chose a particular order for those seven churches, and they are recorded um, that way. If you would, there are four applications to each of these churches. <clears throat> There's a local application. That is, each church has received their letter in that time period. It was a letter to them. It was a reflection of the things that they needed to work on and or change and or continue to do uh, in that time period. There's a general application, I believe, that fits churches in, the, in this age of, of the church. So that I mean, almost every church fits into one of these seven, I'm talking about Christian churches, fits into one of these seven churches. There's a personal application, I believe, in the sense that um, I think every Christian fits into one of these seven churches. And so if you read through those letters and you can, you can say, well, which one, which one of those am I and which one uh, reflects who I am as a, as a person? And, you know, we, we move in and out of those letters over uh, and throughout our Christian ministry. And then I think we'll focus here a little bit today on the prophetic application um, and that is that I believe that each one of these seven churches actually uh, is a time period, a period of time in the church age from the time that Jesus, uh, that Jesus left the earth um, and, uh, and or the Holy Spirit was, was given on the day of Pentecost 
until the present time, and that each one of those ages, actually, we can, we can kind of, uh, we can, I think, very, very definitely fit each, each age into one of those seven uh, churches. I also, uh, in full disclosure, want to tell you that I believe that, all, uh, that there's nothing in the Bible that is insignificant. Nothing. And I will tell you my journey, I, haven't, I don't know that I've always believed that, but my journey personally since COVID has been one of drawing closer and closer to who God is. I was probably a Laodicean Christian three years ago. Today, God's doing a work. I'm just telling you, God's doing a work. And it's not me. I've always been a Christian. But this, this um, revelation of Scripture has really been eye-opening in, in understanding who Jesus Christ is. The entirety of the Bible, people, is about Jesus Christ. The purpose of creation was about Jesus Christ and you and I having the opportunity to be a part of who he is. That's the whole purpose of creation. You know, sometimes we skip over genealogies, numbers, names, places. They're all significant. Very important, I think, in understanding the entirety of the Bible. Genesis to Revelation. There are seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I won't we aren't going to spend any time on this. I put it up there. This is basically what I believe in the church period, um, those seven churches. So that's the history of, of the church age. And as you can see, Laodicea is the last church. And I'm, lab I'm labeling that as the modern church. And so if that is the case, we are living in the last times of the church age. We don't know the day or the hour, but we do know, we should know the seasons and the things that are going on in the world and understanding those according to Scripture. And so we're going to spend our time today talking about the modern church, Laodicea. Each of the seven churches has... Um, has seven elements. So well, most of the churches have seven elements to them. Philadelphia only has six. Laodicea only has six elements. We're going to look at these in a little bit of detail with Laodicea. A little bit of Philadelphia. Um, the outline of the book of Revelation is found in chapter 1, verses 19, or verse 19. John, Jesus tells John, write, therefore, what you have seen, past tense. Any English teacher would tell you that's past tense. What is now, present, what will take place, metatalta is the Greek word, what will take place later, after these things. And so John wrote in the book of Revelation what he had seen. Many people actually believe, there are some the theologians, I shouldn't say many, there are some theologians that actually believe that John wrote the, uh, the Gospel of John about the same time he wrote the book of Revelation. I guess I'm in that camp. He wrote those things which he had seen, which he had witnessed to. He also most likely wrote his three epistles on the island of Patmos. He was exiled there, nothing else to do. He writes those epistles, gets those get that revelation of Scripture out. And so you read the three epistles, you read the, the Gospel of John, and you read it in relationship to the book of Revelation. I think that gives good insight. 
Um, so he writes those things, and he, he talks about here the seven stars are the seven angels. You know, uh, each of those churches had an angel. I, I think every church has an angel. That's my opinion, but you can take that or leave it. I can't scripturally defend that, but I think that, that um, Walnut Grove United Methodist Church has an angel that watches over and guides and directs. But I can't, again, I can't scripturally uh, defend that. But I think it's really neat to think about. Um, <clears throat> if you would like, um, I have done extensive uh, work. Uh, uh, we've done uh, podcasts. My uh, associate pastor, where I attend church in Ada, Ohio, has, uh, we've done podcasts on uh, each of the seven churches. And each of the programs are all about 25 to 30 minutes long. And so if you would like, um, if you have pen and paper and you want to write that address down, or um, Lisa, I'm sure, can get that some to you if you'd like to go back and you'd like to listen to all of those uh, podcasts. I, I don't know. That's, uh, you know, big time commitment, but it, I think it's fun. It, we had fun doing it. Um, and, uh, and or if there was any time uh, after today, maybe you want to throw me out after today, but if you'd want to invite me back, to a uh, Sunday school or whatever, I would be happy uh, to do a little bit more in depth. You know, I think you can't talk about Laodicea without uh, talking about uh, Philadelphia a little bit. Uh, Philadelphia was the model church. So if you want to read about the model church and then the a model church or the mod, or the, the church that you don't want to model yourself after, I think these are the contrasting churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Philadelphia, we all know because we have that city. It's the city of brotherly love. But it's, it's about God loving or, or showing our love to one another because of what God has done uh, for us. You know, Jesus said, uh, on the night of his betrayal, actually commanded the, the uh, apostles. John chapter 15, uh, verse 17, we won't turn there, but 15, John 15 to 17, John records that Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you what? What class? Love, Love one another. Okay? So it is. It's a very important attribute. And so... When, when we talk about Laodicea, we see a lot of squabbling in, in the church, and we see maybe that love isn't. Uh, we also, one of the other things I want to highlight here is that God is holy. We sometimes forget about that about Jesus. Jesus is God. He is one of the, he is one of the Godhead. He is fully God, and he is holy. You know, sometimes we want to base our our, uh, we want to base our religion, our theology, our doctrine on emotions. How does it make me feel? How does it make me feel when I go to church? What can I get out of it? Basing that upon emotions and an emotional response. I think that's the modern church. The modern church is it's not, doctrine isn't based upon the reading of the Bible. And so sometimes we pick and choose. The modern church picks and chooses. I know you're dealing with that in your own congregation, aren't you? That it wants to pick and choose and not talk about the whole. And so if I don't like something, what, what the modern church has done, people, is they've created a Jesus in their image. They've created a Jesus that they, that they can tolerate, that they can worship. Instead of basing it upon the truth of the Bible and worshiping God and Jesus for who he is. You know, Philadelphia, if you want to go to the next slide, Philadelphia, there's no criticisms of this church in Philadelphia. And it's called the Open Door Church. And I only say that because you, we're going to see in Laodicea, it's a closed door church. This church is going to be kept from the hour of testing on, that's going to come upon the whole world. It's what, that's what John says. 
It's what Jesus says to the church of Philadelphia. I'm going to keep you from the testing that's going to come upon the whole world. That sounds like the things that are going to happen after in the book, in the book of Revelation. That is the tribulation period. And so that brings us to the, to the uh, book of the letter that is written to Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm and neither cold, hot nor cold, I will spit you, vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, the king or the uh, NIV says, um, and I didn't write that down. The NIV says, here I am. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who, has, he, who, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also came, overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the scripture says to the, the spirit says to the churches. Laodicea was a pretty, was a pretty cosmopolitan city in uh, ancient Turkey. It had a population of about 150,000 people. That would make it about the size of Dayton. It wasn't quite as big as Ephesus, which had about 250,000 people, nor of Rome, which had over a million people in it, but it was still a very large uh, city. It had an 8,000 seat theater and a 30,000 seat uh, seating capacity stadium, which you can see up there on the, on the screen. 30,000 people um, into that <clears throat> arena. It had a marketplace that was over three football fields long and one football field wide. It was an open, a huge open market. Now, you understand that Laodicea was the wealthiest city in this region. It was the capital city. It was the banking center. It was our New York City, if you will. It was the, the, the wealthy section. And Paul had previously written to Laodicea. He, he tells us that in Colossians chapter 4, verse 13. But that's a, that's a lost letter. We don't know what happened to that letter. Maybe it wasn't supposed to be canonized. But he wrote a letter to Laodicea, and Coloss, the book of Colossians is supposed to be shared, and it probably was with the Laodiceans. It was the next-door neighbor. All right? But as in many cases, as in most cases, churches don't necessarily listen to the teaching that they get, do they? We, lis we listen to it on Sunday morning. We, we're open to, to listening to God's word and whatever, you know, uh, pastor wants to uh, preach on that day. But many times we don't take it to heart and put it in place in our, in our businesses and in our communities and in our homes. And that's what's happened to Laodicea. And so Jesus writes a second letter to him. He didn't listen to Paul. They didn't listen to Paul's preaching. And so Jesus um, tells them, uh, sends them another, a, a second letter. You can go on. Lisa, we'll skip right on over to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Laodicea. Um, we talk about the outline of the name of the church is actually the city was named after uh, a pagan queen, a priestess, Laodicea, uh, who was the wife of Antiochus Epiphanes. I don't know if you're a historian, but Antiochus Epiphanes was a Greek uh, 
uh, king who overthrew Jerusalem in about 200 or so uh, BC. He actually set himself up and uh, and uh, set himself up on the throne in the Holy of Holies. If you understand that the temple in Jerusalem, the Holy of Holies is only the only place that that God dwells. It is the place where God dwells, and so Aris. Antiochus Epiphanes actually set himself up in the in um, the temple as God. His wife actually it was her third marriage because she married uh, his older brother and then married his second older brother and then when those two people died she married the third brother, the youngest brother. So his uh, that's the that's the city, that's the culture in which uh, these uh, people, this thriving church, is uh, you know is is living in in that day. The name of the, the name Laodicea actually means common justice, or maybe a mass of people have been judged. In other words, the people's own opinions. What they did is they they've made up their own opinions and they made their own choices. But now Jesus is saying, uh, you know, in that name, and and again, names mean a lot. I I believe that in the book of uh, in the Bible that there's nothing in there that isn't meant to be studied and the name here is that your opinions and choices have been have been weighed and they've been judged and they've been found to be wanting the revelation of jesus here uh, if you if you look at that text jesus is saying called the amen again when do you say amen it's at the end of something isn't it and so this is the Amen Church. What's that mean? I believe it's a very it's a very clear indication. This is the last church, if you're looking at this from a historical per perspective. Jesus calls himself the faithful and true witness. He is faithful and he is true. What is truth? That's a good question today, isn't it? What is truth? I can tell you what Jesus said said, my, my word is truth. The word, <clears throat> the word is Jesus. John 1, 1, the word was in the beginning and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. The word is Jesus. But this, uh, this church has shut, the, has shut the door as we will see. People in the church don't want, uh, you know, Jesus. Uh, a lot of us, we don't, in the modern church, we don't want Jesus cluttering our mind, at least not the, the Bible or the, the teaching of the Bible. If you look at um, the next, there were no commendations. There's nothing that Jesus says that is good about this church. But he has a lot of things to say about what's bad. He says this, you're neither hot nor cold. That doesn't mean that people are running out on the street corner. If I'm hot, I'm on fire for God. You, you, you maybe heard that terminology. It's, I don't think that that's what we're talking about here. You see, Laodicea had, had really bad water. They weren't the cooling, refreshing, drinking water of Colossae. And they weren't the hot springs of another neighboring city of Heropolis. Heropolis was famous, a, a neighboring, a twin city of Laodicea that was famous for its hot springs. And it's still famous there, there today. People come from miles around to uh, go to the mineral springs and the hot springs. But Laodicea was right in the middle. And so they had to get water from they got, had to get water from Colossae or Heropolis, and if they got either one of those through the hot desert uh, or, or the air community in which they lived in, they, they actually, by the time the water was there, it's lukewarm. And it had to be stored. They didn't have any springs in their, in their city, so they had to bring it in through aqueducts, and it had to be stored in containers. And so the water, it was famous for being... Um, bad 
It was just bad water. It was something that if you took a drink of it, you would spit it out of your mouth. It was bad water. So Jesus uses that as a metaphor to tell them that you're really unfit for service. It's not that you, it's not that you have to go out on the street corner. You're not committed. You're the compromise church. You, you, you're willing to go out and, and compromise my name for whatever it is that puts yourself forward. It's the selfish church. What's in it for me? Why do I come to church? It's because what I, you know, I, I don't like to go to church because I don't get anything out of it. You ever heard anybody say that? That's modern lifestyle. That's the modern society. What's in it for me? And it's crept into the church. They were rich and wealthy. They didn't need God. In fact, when they had an earthquake that, that uh, destroyed the, the city in AD 66, Rome wanted to send them money to help rebuild their city. And they said, no, thanks. We don't need your money. We'll rebuild it on our own. They were rich. They were wealthy. They were bankers. They had the large shopping centers. In the modern city, they would, they would have the large shopping centers with the strip malls of automobiles and cars, if you could get one today. <clears throat> it's also the closed door church. Notice that the door has been closed from the inside. Jesus didn't close the door. He didn't have the key. He's relegated to knocking on the door, isn't he? He's willing to come in. He says, I still love you. I'm knocking. Please let me in. But Jesus is not going to kick that door down. He wants our fellowship. And he pleads with them, says, buy my, buy from me while you can. I have riches. You, you think you're rich. I have riches. How many of us are storing up treasure on earth and not in heaven? We're motivated for more. By the way, um, I won't ask you for a show of hands, but who in here believes that they're rich? When you talk about the world population, over 7 billion people, every one of us are in the top 5 to 7% of rich people in the world. If you have running water, if you got up and had, be, had the ability to take a shower, I'm not asking if you took a shower, but <laughs> if you had the ability to take a shower this morning, indoor plumbing, think about the things that you have that there are billions of people that don't have. Do you have food in the refrigerator and in the cupboard? The ability to go purchase it. People, that, that isn't true. Hardly any place in the world except in the Western world. We are rich. We think we, you know, the problem is, is we think we know something. You think you're rich, you're poor. Not talking about money, he's talking about spiritual. You think you have ISAB? See, they had an ISAB. There were three things that they had. They had banking. They had a medicine clinic there that, uh, in uh, Laodicea that treated eye sickness, eye, eye diseases, and people came from all over the Roman Empire because it was in a mineral that they had, and they made a, uh, like a clay substance, but they anointed their eyes, and it, it, it cleared up many of the diseases that people had with, with eye stigmatism and those types of things. You think you have an eye salve? You're blind. You're blind to the spiritual things. 
The other thing that they had that they were famous for that they were sold throughout the Roman Empire was a, was a luxurious black wool that they, they raised the sheep in the, in the local community. <clears throat> and they sold this product all over, again, the Roman Empire. Brought in mon- large amounts of money. You think you got clothes? You're naked. There are some promises and rewards. One is, if you're going to be unfit for service, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. If you're going to compromise, if you're going to be unfit for service, for who I am, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I'm going to discipline you. When's the last time that God disciplined you? When's the last time God disciplined you through the preaching of the word, the reading of the word, or somebody who is a loved one who told you, don't do that, and you listen to them. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. I want to come in. I want to dine with you. See, I think he's talking about the metatalta, the things that are going to happen after. There's going to be a marriage feast in heaven. And he wants you to be a part of that. He wants me to be a part of that. If you're an overcomer, you're going to sit on thrones. A priest and a king. You know, sometimes we, you're walking around without regard, <coughs> excuse me, without regard to um, advancing God's word here in this modern church. We don't have any spiritual clothes, we're naked, we're blind, and the world's on fire. And the thing that we're most concerned about is when's our next vacation? What are the grandkids doing? What are the kids doing? Whether or not your kid can play basketball or baseball or whatever sport that is. Following the latest uh, trends of the Buckeyes or the NFL. Folks, the world is burning down around us. It's hitting home. You know, you, and I will tell you this. This is where I was. Not interested in fighting moral fights. I'm not interested in fighting for, you know, someone else's freedom or to stop abortion or the neglect and abuse or sex trafficking of children. But, folks, those things are happening in the world. They're happening. Every day, they're happening today. Drug abuse. We need to be in tune to those things. And we can make a difference. The things that we do in our lives. Just in conclusion, John wrote this uh, in his epistle. We know that we have come to know him. I'm talking about 1 John 2, 3 through 6. We know that we have come to him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, the love of God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. This is key. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. 1 John 5, 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. In the last slide, you know, the ripple effect. 
you say, Jeff, I, yeah, I understand, you know, maybe the world's on fire and we're living in this modern day church and society is, is really erratic and, you know, you know what, what can I do about it? And I can tell you that there's a ripple effect. See, your decisions, you think they just impact you. You think, well, I don't care. It isn't hurting anybody else. But where I go, where I buy things, where I go, the internet sites I visit, the places you spend your time and money, they're a stone in the water. And it's a ripple effect. And it impacts your family, church, schools, neighborhoods, work, social groups, society, and even the historical direction of cultures. We've had the mass shootings in Buffalo and Texas. Man, our hearts go out to those people. Symptoms of an egalitarian culture that has lost its moral compass. Listen to me close. We've lost our moral compass. That is the church. We've forgotten God. We've compromised our understanding of biblical doctrine. You know, you might hear people say, this doesn't happen in other societies. First of all, that's wrong. It does. But secondly, many of the so-called safer societies don't have the freedoms that we do in the United States. My fear is that people will be willing to sacrifice their freedom for security and safety. And I understand we got to keep all of our kids safe. We got to keep our culture safe. But not at the price of totalitarianism. Are you living for Jesus today? You know, we're going to have a time of reflection and prayer. I've seen that in the bulletin. We're not going to do that right now. But <clears throat> let's think about what we have to repent, each and every one of us, and commit our lives or recommit our lives to the work. You know, Jesus says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us for all, from all unrighteousness. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we uh, lift your name up. We thank you, Father, for the word that you have. It's convicting. It's sharp. It's a double-edged sword. It pierces our heart. Father, help us to be um, better stewards. Father, I, I confess I have not been as faithful as I should be. And I'm sure that there are many here that are praying the same prayer. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us, guide us, help us to draw closer to you, not to do that in our own strength, but to rely upon you. And we ask and we pray this in the holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Price, for that uh, inspiring message. At this time, I um, want to take a little bit of time now and reflect on what we have and what we can offer to the church in time of, uh, of an offering, whether it be by monetary or by service or by whatever. So, Betty?
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we bring to you our tithes and our offerings, uh, that small, uh, small piece that we can bring back to help in our church, in our country, and in our world. And we thank you for the many things that you have blessed us with. And like I said, we just bring back a small portion to give to you. These things we bring to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Price to come forward and we'll stand for our benediction and blessing. time that we've been able to gather here. We pray a blessing upon this church. Upon Pastor Glenn to see you uh, to see his returning. And Father, we pray that your uh, that your word would continue to go forward uh, now out of this church and in this congregation. We just pray this in your holy name. Amen. <laughs>